This podcast series contains a discussion of historical violence, racism, and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. At the age of 16, Willie Leapart was facing a death sentence. The black teenager had been tried and convicted of raping a white woman in 1890s South Carolina. Within weeks, he faced the prospect of being hanged. This was the beginning of the Jim Crow era in the South. And as we talked about in the last episode of this series, it was extraordinary that Willie's case went through the legal system at all. Local authorities took extreme precautions to prevent Willie from being abducted and lynched before he could go on trial, a very real possibility in the rural South at the time. The Lexington County Sheriff and his deputies even took the precaution of locking themselves into the jail with Willie ahead of his trial and had the jailhouse key hand-delivered to the prosecutor for safekeeping overnight. If Willie Leapart was going to hang, the powers that be in South Carolina in 1890 wanted to ensure it was done by the book. Here's how a South Carolina paper described the process of securing the prisoner for trial. Sheriff Drafts, as soon as he heard of the threats and preparation for lynching, surrounded himself with a dozen of the bravest men of the county, and they, with himself, every night since Monday, have been locked up inside the jail, and the keys of the premises were taken over to Solicitor Nelson at the hotel, who retained them in his possession until the morning. Now, in the 21st century, that might sound like an odd way to guard a prisoner in jail, But that's how seriously law enforcement had to take the threat of a lynching in 1890. And some sources refer to the period between the end of Reconstruction, so late 1870s, early 1880s through early 20th century. Some scholars refer to that as a nadir period of African-American history, of the African-American experience. This is Jennifer Dixon McKnight, an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. 1920s, 1930s, you know, lynching is at an all-time high in that time period. And some argue that the bulk of lynching happens in that 1880s, 1890s to 1920s moment or era. Some sources say 4,000 lynchings. Um, Other sources will say 5,000 lynchings recorded. I would argue there are more. We know that record-keeping then isn't like it is now. There were some lynchings or a large number of lynchings that were public and very much a spectacle, Um, but there were a number that happened that never made the record books, right? And so we could argue that that's a good working number to start with, but we could easily assume that we can add hundreds and maybe even thousands more to that number across the South. Willie was convicted of breaking into the home of one of Lexington's most prominent families, a well-to-do home on Lexington's Main Street, and sexually assaulting their nanny, 18-year-old Rosa Cannon. He was convicted of the shocking crime in a day by an all-white jury and sentenced to death by a judge who had been a general in the Confederate Army. In the wake of such a conviction, it would be easy to think that Willie's case was more or less done. And if things had played out differently, maybe it would have been. But Willie's court-appointed attorney, George Graham, decided not to let Willie go to the gallows quietly. I'm Bristow Marchant, a reporter for the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. And this is The Wrong Walk Home, The Lynching of Willie Leapart, a podcast from McClatchy and the state about the improbable turns in the case of an historic injustice. So far in this series, we've looked at the accusations made against Willie Lee Park in this small southern town and the trial that led to his death sentence. In our third episode, we'll look at the lawyer who stepped up on Willie's behalf and improbably nearly got him off. After his one-day rape trial on February 21st, 1890, Willie continued to be held in the county jail ahead of his planned execution. Back then, the jail was located in the middle of what is now downtown Lexington, a squat brick building. It was torn down decades ago to build what locals now call the Old County Courthouse. Court business moved to a more modern facility years ago, 
but the old courthouse still stands on Main Street today. So now we're standing in front of the courthouse, mm. which back then, the this is now the old courthouse, but back then the courthouse would have been on the other side of correct. the street here, and this would have been the, the county jail. Correct, correct. It, what you would have seen is a granite building there. Local researcher Michael Burgess and I took a trip to the courthouse to get a feel for what it would have been like back then. They describe that there's a jail yard behind this building where there is a hanging tree and that prisoners would be that were sentenced to death would have been hung behind the building and then buried at either the white or the African-American uh, Popper's Field, which is outside of town. Uh, this would have been, you know, where Willie Lee Park would have been hung had the governor not granted him a reprieve. But the governor grants a reprieve in early April, a, a stay of execution, not an exoneration. And the intent is to give Graham time to file for a second trial based on new evidence that is uncovered by early April 1890. That's right, Willie's legal battle didn't end with his death sentence. George Graham truly believed in his client's innocence, and he set out to tell a more complex version of Willie's story than the one presented at his trial. He did this even though Graham had asked to be excused from the case because he knew defending Willie would not be a popular stance to take in Lexington. And Graham would take that story in the form of a legal appeal all the way to South Carolina Governor John Richardson. The building blocks of that story really begin to emerge as Willie sat in the Lexington County Jail awaiting execution. George Graham went to work to build an airtight defense for his client. Graham was a well-respected young lawyer in what was then a town of about 300 people. He began building a petition for clemency from South Carolina's governor soon after Willie's conviction convinced that he had enough evidence to get Willie's death sentence overturned. Graham's work now would cement his place in local history, and it would also make him enough enemies that for a while, he would be forced to move out of the state. Graham knew Willie had a strong alibi. Multiple witnesses had seen him at New Bethel AME Church during an evening service the night Rosa said she was attacked. But when it came time for them to testify in Willie's defense, None of them showed up at the courthouse. That was probably because black witnesses testifying in defense of someone accused of attacking a white woman were likely to be intimidated out of coming forward. You know, the whole reason that double-digit witnesses don't testify is this fear of violence being done to them by the white community if they were to go and contradict the word of a white woman. You know, we're at the height of where Southern white womanhood, the honor of Southern white womanhood is paramount in the white community. Michael Burgess is a local high school history teacher who helped to bring Willie's story back to life more than 130 years after a major injustice was done in South Carolina. He only got involved while researching a question from a student at River Bluff High School about whether any lynchings had occurred in the town of Lexington, South Carolina. His research not only unearthed Willie Leapart's story, but also ended up finding many records of what happened in the case. Michael highlights the work of George Graham in fighting on Willie's behalf, Atticus Finch-like, even after the death sentence had been handed down. That included gathering witness statements from those who said they saw Willie at the time the attack took place. In our documentation, there is an affidavit signed by his father, Dahl Leapart, with an X. He, could, he couldn't write his name, which is not a, a, un, atypical of this time period. And it indicated double-figure witnesses that were going to testify that Willie was at the church the whole night. Yet when the trial is held on February 21st, Graham gives the alibi, but there are no witnesses for Graham to call. Those witnesses saw Willie Leapart on the night of January 26, 1890, at a church service at New Bethel AME Church, the town's main black congregation, located about a mile from where Rosa Cannon was attacked. It was a common event in small town South Carolina at the time for folks to gather for lengthy evening church services that would draw the whole community together. In fact, across town, one of the area's most prominent white couples, Simeon and Martha Ann Corley, 
were also attending an evening service at Lexington's main white church, St. Stephen's Lutheran. They had left their little daughter at their main street home in the care of Rosa, their live-in nanny, and Rosa's younger brother, Owen. While the Corleys were gone, Rosa told investigators an unknown black man supposedly came into the house through an open window, threatened her and her brother, and demanded they give him food. When Rosa's brother ran to get help, Rosa later told the jury the intruder had attacked and sexually assaulted her. Here's how Rosa's testimony at Willie's trial was reported in the Orangeburg Times and Democrat. Her wrongs were detailed by her today on the stand in a modest and convincing manner. While passing across this passageway, Miss Cannon was seized by the Negro, who said it was not bread that he wanted, and threw the young lady to the floor, and in spite of her screams and efforts to free herself from his grasp, he accomplished his fiendish purpose. The crime against Rosa had the white community of Lexington up in arms, literally, a crowd of white men summoned by 14-year-old Owen Cannon came to the Corley house and Rosa's attacker ran away. Willie was apprehended while walking somewhere in town and brought to Rosa, who identified him as her attacker, as she stated in a statement to investigators. The brute was a stranger to me, though I had seen him before. But every look of his hideous face and the tone of his disgusting voice was all so indelibly stamped on my memory that I described him so accurately that he was at once caught and identified by me and my brother without the possibility of a mistake. And the party who was brought before me for identification by my description and whom I identified is the party whom they tell me is Willie Leapart. That story convinced a jury, but how reliable was Rosa's identification of Willie as her attacker? Seth Stoughton researches the criminal justice system as a professor at the University of South Carolina. He says we now know these kinds of eyewitness statements are notoriously unreliable. We now know that that type of identification procedure is really unreliable, especially when we're talking about cross-racial identifications, that is a white woman identifying a black man. Uh, and we know that there are all kinds of pressures that come from being confronted and say, hey, is this the guy? Not look through these photos and find the guy, right? But is this the guy right here? Uh, there are social pressures and psychological pressures that can lead to false, that have led to false identifications. And we know they've led to false identifications because we have DNA exonerations where we can prove to a degree of scientific certainty that the person who was identified is not the person who actually committed the crime. And yet, in many jurisdictions, we still see officers using what are called show-up procedures that may be different in context, but are very similar in form to what you're describing here. Officers find someone, bring them to the victim and say, is this the guy? Or if they do a photographic lineup, they often do it in a way that does not mitigate the risk of false identifications. Nevertheless, in 1890 South Carolina, Rosa's word should have been enough to doom Willie. But despite his reluctance to defend a black man facing such a charge, Graham did his job, and he believed the statements he got from witnesses at New Bethel exonerated the young man. One witness in Willie's defense, Thomas Waring, wrote in an affidavit that he had been with Willie for all but 20 minutes when Waring left the church to briefly return to his home around 9 p.m., and then Waring headed back to the church. In Graham's telling, this left Willie little time to go across town on foot to commit the crime and then get back to the church by the time Waring returned. Michael has walked the route from the church to the side of the old Corley house many times, and it's at least a 30 minute walk one way. If you believe the statements given by people at the church, then Michael thinks it's unlikely Willie could have been the perpetrator. However, if you wanna conjecture, well, well, he could have done it. Just understand, he would have had to have been at a solid jog at this point in 1890 clothes, which is not a windsuit, not running tights, not running shorts in, in, in January of 1890, and have committed this crime and taken five minutes to do it, according to the prosecution, uh, and then hustled back down here. <laughs> 
Graham noted this time constraint in his petition to the governor asking for clemency. He also cast doubt on Rose's claim that she was raped. This is how Graham put it in his petition. Yet she never mentioned to a single person that a rape had actually been committed until the said court had convened. And after the solicitor had actually obtained a bill against your petitioner, charging him with an assault and battery with the intent to commit rape on her. Graham highlights inconsistencies in Rose's story and questions whether the attack could have happened in such a short time frame. He also noted that the older Rosa actually may have had a physical advantage over the younger Willie, questioning whether Willie could have overpowered her, as she said. Rosa Cannon is equally as large, and in fact taller than your petitioner, and consequently it is a physical impossibility for your petitioner to have committed a rape on her. Graham also draws on the statements of Owen Cannon, Rosa's brother, who was present for the attack and was the one who ran to get help. Presumably, Owen also testified at Willie's trial, although the trial records have since disappeared. But Graham quotes Owen as saying he ran about 75 yards from the Corley house before he ran into Mr. Stewart and returned with him to the house. Just before reaching the house, they met said Rosa Cannon, but did not see any other person. And that in going from the house to where he met Stewart and back to the house, that he ran as fast as he could. That from the time he saw the person in the window to the time he ran and met with Stewart and got back to the house was less than five minutes. Graham wrote the governor that based on the prosecution's own timeline of events that night, it was not a physical possibility that Willie could have made the trip to the house and back to New Bethel Church in the time available. Your petitioner most respectfully submits and says that before God, he is not guilty of the offense of which he stands convicted. Neither does he believe any fair-minded man living could believe that it was a physical possibility for your petitioner to have committed the offense charged under which he stands convicted in the length of time proved by the state in this case, to say nothing of the testimony offered on behalf of your petitioner. Graham gives us some sense of the fear that Willie must have been living under, and the understanding that a violent death awaited him in only a matter of days. He was frequently threatened to be lynched, but for the manhood of the sheriff and his honor, the presiding judge. Your petitioner, therefore, was not much surprised at the verdict of the jury. Your petitioner sincerely believes that if his sentence is commuted to imprisonment in the state penitentiary, that in the space of a very short time, the truth will come out, and that it'll be established conclusively to the world that your petitioner is not guilty of the offense. And that unless God in his divine wisdom directs your excellency and his honor the presiding judge to intervene on behalf of your petitioner and extend the hand of clemency to him, a great injustice will be done and the innocent blood of your petitioner will be shed. What makes this appeal so much more extraordinary is that again, George Graham had originally wanted to be dropped as Willie's attorney. And now he's arguing in very strong terms to the governor that Willie is innocent of a crime the state was ready to kill him for. Despite the evidence offered in his petition, Graham's initial appeal to the governor was rejected. Willie's sentence would not be commuted. But then Graham got a little help. See, Graham had noticed at Willie's trial back in February that even as Rosa testified against the person accused of attacking her, none of Rosa's family were present. Her father, a mill worker, lived nearby with Rosa's mother and brothers, but for some reason they stayed away from the trial. Graham got the help of a U.S. Marshal to investigate and came up with more evidence that poked holes in Rosa's story. Now, the initial March 29th petition is rejected by the governor. Here's Michael Burgess again. But in the first week in April, Graham, using a U.S. Marshal, will present affidavits. Now, the U.S. Marshal is a Republican. He's from the Gilbert area. At this time, the only political offices that that a Republican can hold are federally appointed. Uh, his name is W.J. Miller. And he will present to George Graham, who will present to the governor, that they have letters from the young woman, Rosa Cannon, in which she stated Lee Part had committed no outrage on her person, and at worst, if that was him, had simply grabbed her for the purposes to give him money, but and ultimately that none of her family believed that he had attempted to commit any outrage, 
etc. Meanwhile, there's another affidavit from her older brother, Charlie Cannon, said that he had a private talk with his sister shortly after the alleged crime, and she said she wasn't injured in any way, and she did not believe it was Leapart's intention to do any harm, uh, and further told Charlie that she would never have sworn against Leapart because she couldn't really recognize him. And in fact, in a letter to her mother, she says, I didn't, I don't really know, I don't really don't know if it's him. Uh, so there's all this evidence that begins to swirl that, you know, that if she didn't lie, she was at least being manipulated into making statements that simply weren't true. And that in her letters to her mother, and, and how did Miller get those? Well, Miller uh, operated as a type of part-time secretary, I guess, because the Cannon family w w was evidently not great at writing or reading letters. And so Miller is the one who is reading these letters back and forth, or perhaps writing these in this correspondence from Rosa to her mother. And in fact, in one of the letters, like I mentioned, she states that she does not realize, really know who the party was that seized her. This is an odd case of someone, in this case a U.S. Marshal, raising a defense by essentially airing the Cannon family's dirty laundry in a legal filing based on his reading of their personal correspondence between parents, children, and siblings. But it also shows how even after the end of Reconstruction, when newly freed blacks were granted full civil rights, at least on paper, that federal officials were still active in the South in trying to protect those rights. But it also makes sense that if he is a Republican-appointed federal marshal, that Republicans, of course, uh, had supported the 14th and 15th Amendment, uh, if they didn't believe, if some of them didn't believe in full citizenship for African Americans, they were supportive of it. But what is ironic in this correspondence from Rosa is she points the finger at Manuel Simeon Corley as the one that persuaded her that Willie Leapart was the guy, which we, which we find and completely out of character for him. But I think the Southern Code of Honor stands out more for him, that, that if she had recanted her statements, that it would have reflected poorly upon him. And therefore, even though he is sort of an odd leader in the community, uh, he is still a, a well-thought-of figure uh, in the town of Lexington. But controversy would follow Graham's submission of the affidavits to Governor Richardson, as powerful people in Lexington County would rise up to counter them, and accuse both Graham and Miller of faking the documents. Michael explains what happened next. The story gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and all the rumors about Rosa comes out, and all the other suspicions comes out, and then the, the battle over the authenticity of the affidavits. W.J. Miller gave to George Glenn, Graham, who gave it to the governor, to grant Lee Parter reprieve comes out, and it is this firestorm of controversy. Uh, it is not at all like any other lynching that I am familiar with, uh, in, at least in my 52 years and being a historian in the South. George Graham and W.J. Marshall's arrested by Lexington officials with the accusation being made that they forged the affidavits. Well, the Governor Richardson had had enough by that point and made sure they got, he got Graham and Miller out of jail. But for a brief moment, they were all in jail together. You know, where Graham is really never threatened or endangered, W.J. Miller is a different story. He is essentially run out of Lexington County, and he ends up, as we mentioned, being jailed for the affidavit. And where Graham is released, and he is initially released, Miller's arrested again, and this time jailed in Richland County. And he is going to stay in jail in Richland County for almost a year. But by the spring of 1891, he is, he is dying, really because of the conditions in the Richland County Jail. And on March 28, 1891, uh, as he is close to dying, uh, Miller makes one of two deathbed confessions. And in both of those, he talks about his connection to Patrick Cannon, the father of Rosa, that he heard of and read her letters, 
that he made the affidavit upon which Judge Wallace acted and that he did everything. And, and it's interesting what's noted in, in the article. And this is, again, special to the Augusta Chronicle. I believe the state newspaper actually writes the article. And it says, quote, this confession, if believed, would clear Judge Graham from the charge of forgery and conspiracy to secure Lee Parts reprieve. And then he makes another deathbed confession. It's taking him a long time to die in which he vouches for that, yes, everything that was in the affidavits, everything that was in those letters was true. And thus pointing to that Rosa Cannon, whether it's from sheer dishonesty or being, or being manipulated, had said all the things that would indicate that Willie Lee Part was indeed innocent. Despite all that controversy, those stunning affidavits had the effect Graham was looking for. This time, he was able to get a reprieve from the governor. Willie Leapart, despite all the circumstances acting against him, would not be hanged in April 1890. For that matter, his case might get sent back to court. By May of 1890, Graham is confident he will be exonerated. That is completely unusual, and, and that struck me, for, and, and for anyone, who has read the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, this is an 1890s Atticus Finch. The other thing that struck me is typically in this period, your governor uh, is upholding uh, Jim Crow, which would have been implemented at this time. The governor actually makes a very unpopular decision to grant Willie a, a reprieve from execution, a stay of execution until a second trial can be held which is also surprising when you think about South Carolina in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, so when you think about those elements, it makes for a really unique and unusual story that, that flies against the typical lynching that occurs hundreds if not thousands of times across the South during this time period. But any sense of optimism for Willie, his family, or George Graham would be short-lived. Besides the legal accusations against Graham and Miller over the affidavits, there were other forces conspiring against justice for Willie. Someone in Willie's position would be in danger in ordinary circumstances. But this case was about to become a political football in one of the most consequential elections in South Carolina history. And some very powerful people may have had good reason to never let Willie leave the Lexington County Jail alive. Next time on The Wrong Walk Home. Reconstruction was not this desegregated utopia marked only by a couple of the incidents of white supremacists. Like you saw throughout the South, there was a kind of um, attempt to impose basically new slavery uh, on a lot of these freedmen. There's a racial etiquette that involves not being able to look at white people and black people can't look at white people in the face. You know, she could have put the screws to the father and said, well, if you want your job, she needs to go away. I'm Bristow Marchant. The Wrong Walk Home is a product of the state newspaper. It's produced by Lume Alasali, Jennifer Molina, Frizanthi Pickett, Kata Stevens, and Joshua Boucher. Special thanks to Don Blunt. For lots more on this story, visit thestate.com slash Leapart. If you have more details on Willie Leapart's life, death, or descendants, email me at bmarchant at thestate.com.